Good morning, everybody. Good afternoon, uh, depending on where you are. Welcome to Deloitte's Debrief Stacks webcast series in Asia Pacific. Our webcast today is from our Global Mobility, Talent and Reward series and is titled Labor Codes, Update on State Rules and Overall Status. My name is Saraswati Kasturi Rangan and I'm a tax partner based in Deloitte India Bangalore office. I have the pleasure of hosting today's webcast. I have two speakers with me today, Radhika Vishwanathan and Tarun Garh from the India practice. Radhika is a tax executive director based out of Chennai and Tarun is a tax director based out of Delhi. You may access our bios on the left side of the screen. <clears throat> Before I introduce the agenda for today's webcast, I'd like to take a moment to highlight some of the features of the webcast console. All users are on listen only mode. If you have any content related questions, please do submit the same in the Q&A box. You can see this at the bottom right side of your screen. We'll do our best to respond to your questions during the presentation itself. Second, all PC users can maximize or minimize each box at your convenience during the webcast. You may also explore the icons at the bottom of the screen. If you want to download today's slides and the related publications, please do go to the downloads and links box. Mobile device users can view the slides and answer the survey on screen. Third, if you require an attendance record for this event, you can download your CPE certificate by clicking this request CPE icon at the bottom of the webcast console. I would like to start today's session with an overview of the topics that we plan to discuss today. Our topic for today's session is Labor Code's update on state rules and overall status. The four labor codes, namely the Code on Wages, the Code on Social Security, the Industrial Relations Code, and the Occupational Safety, Health and Working Conditions Code need no introduction. We have discussed the changes that will impact organizations because of these labor codes during our earlier webcast in pretty much of detail. A quick recap, these codes have the objective of unifying, simplifying the plethora of current labor related legislations and also widen the coverage to the unorganized sector, which is a very welcome change. The codes bring in significant implications, both to employers and the workforce. Over the next 45 to 50 minutes, we'll take a look at what the current status of the codes are, what are the areas of impact. We would also touch upon the status of the draft rules issued by the states, how they align or maybe deviate from the central rules, and the interplay between the Shops and Establishments Act and the Labor Codes. And then we will move on to answer some of the questions that you all may have. Please do remember to drop in your questions in the Q&A box. Let us start with an overview of the status of the Labor Codes. There has been quite a lot of discussion around the date of implementation of these codes and the speculation from the media on the time and the manner of implementation of these codes. When will the codes be made effective? What is the impact on the employer? Would the employers have to make changes to the employee salary structure, payroll policies, processes? What would be the impact on employee take home pay? These are some of the questions on top of our minds and we'll try to discuss and answer these in today's session. Let me go on with an overview of the codes. The four labor codes, subsuming the 29 central labor regulations, seek to continue, consolidate and simplify the labor regulations. They also expand the coverage by bringing in broader categories of workforce within their purview. Well, this is a massive reform and it seeks to enhance the ease of doing business through the use of technology and digitization. The four codes have received the presidential assent after the parliamentary approval process is done and now are awaiting the notification of the effective date by the central government. The central rules for all the four codes are available in draft form. Obviously, they are in draft because the codes are not yet effective, so they can't be in a final form. Significant number of states have also issued the draft rules, signifying their buy-in to the labor reforms. Once the center announces the effective date, this would trigger the issue of final rules by the center, 
followed by the states and we expect that there would also be certain clarificatory notifications and circulars that the governments would issue. There are quite a few open points under the labor codes, including how will wages be determined? And it's a practical question, whether it would include variable pay, how would lump sum payouts be treated? Can there be a relaxation on wage settlement timeline? These are some aspects on which the industry has sought clarity from the government. We do expect that these will be addressed through the rules or through notifications subsequent to the operationalization of the courts. Uh, Saraswath, can I stop you for a moment here? Uh, now, there's already one question that is popping up on the effective date of the courts, and I think you also started with that. You've been interacting with various industry bodies as well as the ministry on this. What's your take on the likely effective date? Well, Radhika, that's, that's a very interesting question. Uh, um, well, we are all aware that the government has been focusing a lot on getting the various states to issue the state rules. So it's not as if there's been a silence from the side, but apparently it looks to be so. So there has been significant process on this front. The government has also received a lot of feedback from the industry, and we understand they are gearing up to address most of this, if not all of this, through the final rules. Uh, we believe that the ministry team seems to be geared up with the final rules. Um, and hence, I do definitely expect the codes to be effective in 2022. And I'll elaborate this in the next slide. Um, so let me just take you through that as to what the government has been doing uh, in the meantime. So if you look at the bottom right-hand corner of the slide, uh, we've tried to highlight the government's efforts in bringing these codes live in 2022. The Ministry of Labor and Employment issued a publication this happened sometime in November or October last year, uh, which was entitled New Labor Codes for New India. Uh, well, this book, booklet explained why, what was the need for labor codes. It calls out the positives to the employer and to the employees. It talks about how it would favorably impact employees from a retirement benefit perspective, um, from a trade union recognition perspective. So clearly they've spent some time trying to market uh, the positives of the labor codes and have taken this very seriously. There has also been a lot of focus on the state governments. So they've been interacting with the state governments and trying to get all of them to publish their draft rules, thereby ensuring the buy-in of the states. And we also know that it's not as if the, the codes have not been made effective at all. Some sections um, have already been made, have already been notified and made effective. So clearly it's a matter of time before the effective date is announced. Um, uh, just to refer back the sections which they have already notified relate to uh, the coating of Aadhaar for um, availing certain benefits, um, setting up of advisory board which could there, thereafter set up, the, come out with the minimum wages, employment opportunities and so on. Those advisory boards have been set up and the related provisions have been already enact, made effective. So while broadly the codes, we don't expect them to be changed since this would involve parliamentary approval and the presidential assent again, certain clarifications we definitely expect and we expect that this could come either through the final rules or through certain notifications which may come in after the codes have been made effective. We also know that the Minister for Labour and Employment, Mr. Bupendra Yadav, was quoted in the Economic Times uh, about a month or so back clearly articulating that the codes would be made effective in 2022. And it's interesting to note that he also called out that there would be no changes in the codes per se, understandably so. And he talked, called out that some uh, feedback which they have received, they would try to incor incorporate through the rules. So uh, I think 2022 is when we are expecting this to happen. And hence, before moving on, let us look on look at certain key aspects of the code. And what sets them apart from the existing legislations, the 29 of them which have been subsumed? <clears throat> Clearly, um, as a practice of making it uh, simply, uh, practice of simplifying and consolidating the codes, the government has brought in uniformity in definition of wages. In fact, they've brought in uniformity in definition in terms of various. Um, terminology such as who is an employer, who is an employee, who is a contractor, who is a contract labor. Uh, and yes, of course, wages is one of the more important one which will impact the industry. 
from a finance uh, and from even from a practical perspective it has got a wide ranging impact so clearly the uniform definition assumes significant importance uh, digitization this is again something on the cards and the government has consciously tried to reduce the number of filings moving to electronic uh, filings and this is something that would clearly enhance transparency and also ease of operations uh, the other thing which i really uh, found good is the concept of inspector come facilitator uh, bringing in a cultural shift by um, including the role of a facilitator onto the inspector uh, again another positive aspect is the introduction of the limitation period for inquiries this again would definitely enhance the ease of doing business from an organization perspective well so what do organizations need to do to my mind they need to be mindful of the changes from the existing legislations of the code understand the implication both of the codes as well as the rule and again the central as well as, as, well as the state rules uh basis what we've reviewed we believe that the state rules draft rules are broadly aligned to the central draft rules uh, but there are certain deviations from existing rules and also some deviations from the central rules and organizations uh, need to be mindful of this and it's important to identify the deviations between the central state rules and determine the relevance and the impact of the same especially for organizations who got multi state presence uh, shops and establishments act again this is uh, a state legislation and this continues to prevail hence the codes as well as the shops and establishments act would be in force once the codes are effective and again this is something which organizations need to be mindful of so moving to the next slide and a polling question uh, we thought it will be good for us to pause and get a sense from all our participants to understand their sense on the timeline so the question as you can see on the scr screen is that expecting that the labor code would be effective soon and there is no clarity on the transition time that would be available uh, the question is how prepared is your organization to transition to labor codes your choices are high level of preparedness can manage with a transition of less than 2 months medium level of preparedness with rigorous efforts and that too from all stakeholders you can manage within a transition time of 3 months or more minimal level of preparedness you've just started the journey or you're waiting for the final notification to commence the journey so please do put in your options and while we wait for the response let me turn to radhika radhika what is your take on the transition time uh saraswati i think we may have a very short transition window uh, the reason why i'm saying is uh, we have heard the authorities say time and again that the codes and the draft rules have been there in public domain and everybody had access to this therefore organizations should have done their analysis and made appropriate changes but again this is a major legislative change and we do have some ambiguity in certain aspects uh, starting from the wage definition itself so uh, having no transition or very minimal transition time seems unlikely to so my take would be that there is going to be transition time though it could be a short one maybe a couple of months or three months to say well uh, i agree with you i don't expect too much of a transition time to be given by the government but we do have the answers on the uh, screen uh, so about uh, i've seen about 159 participants i don't think the participants are coming on so uh, let me just wait for a second and i do agree with you radhika uh, totally that it's important for organizations to be prepared because the government there is a strong view within the government that the codes have been in public domain for long and hence uh, no not too much of a transition time can be expected the government is also worried that if there is too much of a transition time given could there be uh, uh, no a stay that is raised by organizations against the censor so, so you you're very right and um, if i do see the polling results what i do see is about significant number of organizations are in the stage of medium medium level of preparedness so maybe with the rigorous efforts from stakeholders can manage the transition time of 3 months or more 
uh, quite a few, about 10% uh, are in high level of preparedness. Uh, there are some who are still waiting for the final notification to come in the journey. And yes, about 16% uh, are at a minimum level of preparedness. I think it's important for organizations to pick up the threads on this conversation and start acting on this. And that is clearly, um, it means that we need to get to know more about the labor codes. So Radhika, why don't you quickly take us through the changes, implications, and the areas one needs to look out for? Over to you. So the first and foremost change that comes to my mind is the new wage definition. And I'm sure all of us have heard about this definition, starting with all remuneration, then we have the list of exclusions, deemed inclusions, and the benefits in kind. Over the last two years, we've been hearing this. So I wouldn't get into the details there. However, there's one aspect that I wanted to touch upon, which is the view that wages can be kept at 50% of total remuneration. Uh, to say in other words, that's the threshold that needs to be met. But that's not how it is in reality. The exclusion list, as you know, is very specific and can at the maximum be 50% of remuneration. So it could also be lower. So if you take a compensation structure that has only gratuity and provident fund from the exclusion list, your wages could be hovering as high as 80%. So as a result, organizations will first have to evaluate their structure vis-a-vis -vis the new wage definition and determine wages to understand the impact. Now, we know that the definition is constant and it forms the base for computing the benefits under the codes. Uh, be it either contributions to provident fund, gratuity entitlement, or payouts, or maternity benefit. The wage will also determine whether an employee or worker will be covered for statutory bonus or the state insurance uh, coverage. If I have to elaborate a little on this, when we know that today anyone drawing wages in excess of 21,000 per month will not be covered for these, wages will have to be computed using the new definition going forward before it can even be a comparison. Further, depending on how wages was calculated previously, one can expect the number of employees covered to show a change. Uh, staying on ceiling limits, the Payment of Wages Act today is applicable only to those drawing wages less than 24,000 per month. This ceiling is being removed under the courts. Therefore, the related provisions dealing with wage period or settlement timelines, reduction from wages and the cap thereon will be applicable to one and all going forward. This wider coverage could call for a review of the current payroll processes, the systems in place, as also advanced planning and accurate estimations by employers. The next point relates to base that is being used for determining provident fund contributions or gratuity or maternity benefit. Now, while it will be wages going forward, we should not forget that this could be very different from the base that is being applied today. With the transition provisions in place for provident fund, we may still not have a significant impact except for specified categories like the international worker population or those who are drawing less than 15,000 uh, and not contributing at 1,800 per month. But not the case with gratuity. With gratuity to be computed on last drawn wages, we could be in for a past service impact based on the current provisions. So we are talking about a one-time cost as well as an ongoing annual cost here which is why there's been a representation to the government to define last drawn wages. But we need to wait and see if this is accepted and included in the final rules. We could also be seeing some retroactive impact for leave attachment that establishments will need to be mindful of. Now here, as well as for overtime, the base for computing the payout is wages, which is again based on the new definition. Also, if we see the code on wages, it provides for overtime for all employees in contrast to the wordings under the OSH code, where this is restricted to workers. Uh, the Minimum Wages Act also provides for overtime only to those engaged in scheduled employment. So here again, we know that there has been a representation to the ministry highlighting the dichotomy. And the expectation is that the wordings under the OSH code mirror the intent. And hence, that would be the final version. But it's not all about numbers. The courts have also brought in procedural changes. Uh, if I can name a few provisions enabling women to work night shifts beyond normal working hours, widening coverage of measures like standing orders, which would be applicable to all industrial establishments, meaning the service sector gets covered too, 
enhanced contributions on retrenchment. We have a 15-day wage equivalent to be contributed to reskilling fund, notification to the career centers about vacancies, recognition of trade union as the negotiating union, and so on. There are also restrictions on employing contract labor for non-core activities. All these call for new policies, processes to be put in place, realigning your existing ones, and communicating the changes clearly to all the stakeholders, which is why time is essence. On its part, the government has also made an attempt to help establishments as they undertake the compliances. And Saraswati, you had called it out earlier by extending the role of inspector to that of a facilitator as well. So establishments now have a recourse when in doubt rather than wait for the consequence. Well, Radhika, one point that we notice on the slide is the inclusion of gig workers and the platform workers and impact on aggregators. This seems to be a totally new under the labor codes and it's part of the government's move to widen the social security base for the unorganized sector. From a practical perspective, how will this impact the organizations if you can throw some light on this? What approach do you think the organizations should adopt to align to the requirements? So, Tarun, the code on social security has certainly extended the coverage to the unorganized sectors. Further, there is a specific uh, mention in respect of gig and platform workers too. So clearly the codes impact not just the regular employees in an organization, but the provisions are relevant to the broader workforce as well. So it is important for organizations to identify the various kinds of workforce that they are deploying and then determine the relevant compliances that they need to adhere to. So let me take you through this in the next slide. So as you can see in this slide, the workforce can broadly be classified into regular workforce, meaning employees and the broader non-employee workforce. For instance, the compliances relating to workers, women employees, international workers and fixed term employees are varied. It is also important to recognize the need to identify migrant workers, building and construction workers, home-based workers, etc. We have changes facilitating women to work beyond normal working hours, process for obtaining consent from them, safety measures to be put in at the workplace, transportation support. Now, all these are relevant from a woman employee perspective. State governments have already started issuing notifications for the procedural aspects on these. Secondly, those employed for a fixed tenure, the FTEs as we call them, and being on par with regular employees when it comes to hours of work, working conditions and benefits will now be eligible for gratuity. Of course, provided uh, they complete one year of service. This is going to be an additional cost that needs to be factored. Interestingly, expatriate employees or the international workers as we keep referring to them could fall into this category, which could result in a significant cost impact. On gig and platform workers, currently the draft rules provide for procedures relating to their registration. Additionally, if an organization qualifies as an aggregator, now we know that the court specifically calls out nine such categories, uh, which include ride sharing services, food and grocery delivery services, logistic services, e marketplace, etc. They would be required to contribute 1 to 2% of the annual turnover limited to 5% of the payouts being made to gig or platform workers as contributions to the social security fund. Similar payouts may also be required by other establishments in respect of such workforce. So we will need to wait and watch for details from the government on this. We are already seeing some reports of state governments also uh, preparing their draft rules because uh, for gig workers, they will have to issue rules relating to the eligibility criteria. On contract labor, as I mentioned earlier, they cannot be employed in non-core activities unless this is the norm or it is during the peak season. What is core activity is also provided for and hence organizations will have to evaluate if they have employed contract labor in non-core activities, if yes, does it meet the conditions or how to realign it. While we know the range for contributions as an aggregator and the registration requirements, the government is yet to notify the scheme relating to gig or platform workers, and hence uh, the wait and watch continues. Uh, okay, the codes are being extended to unorganized workers, but why is there so much noise about the coverage to gig and platform workers? In my view, this is because we could be in for a significant financial impact here, besides the procedural requirements. Uh, organizations could have consultants on board. The arrangements would have to be revisited to understand if they check the box for qualifying as a gig or a platform worker, 
And if they do, what would be the resultant costs and the compliances that need to be undertaken? Uh, with advancement in technology and availability of online platforms, preference for self-employment, this is going to be a critical area of change. Saraswati, would you agree? You think this aspect is worth every penny of the attention that it's getting? Oh, certainly, Aradhika. I think this is where the government has really expanded the social security benefits to the wider population and brought in clarity that the gig and platform workers are not required to be treated as employees, unlike in many other countries. For instance, in the US, in the state of California, there was a requirement that such a workforce are required to be treated on par with employees. Same with UK, where there has been a recent ruling uh, where such platform workers were required to be treated as employees. But I think uh, um, under the labor codes, the authorities are adopting an approach that gig workers and platform workers uh, need to be treated from a social security perspective. There is an additional benefit that needs to be provided, but they need not really be treated as employees. I think this is a clarity that is uh, different and welcome. And this is more relevant now, given that the future of workforce seems to be moving away from regular and traditional employer-employee relationship. So would want uh, to be uh, working for multiple organized agents to make best use of their skills. So I think this is welcome. And the government is actually supplementing this with the uh, um, Subhita so uh, so portal as well, where there is going to be a registration of unorganized workers. So that's my take on it, uh, Radhika. Back to you. Thank you, sir. And I'll absolutely agree with you. Now, uh, while we do have new provisions, widening of coverage, consolidation of legislations, we must be mindful that there are certain legislations that do continue. And as you called out right at the start, the Shops and Establishments Act is one such legislation that is continuing. And hence, organizations need to be mindful of this. So as we will be aware, the Shops and Establishments Act has provisions relating to hours of work, like specifying the start time, the end times, what would be deducted from wages, how much leave would an employee be entitled to, what are the real rules relating to encashment of accumulated leave and so on. Now, some states even have provisions governing maternity benefits. So if the Shops and Establishments Act and Labor Code provisions are aligned, then we don't have an issue at all. However, that's not the case, and hence the question, what happens if there is a difference? Which one would prevail? So let us take some example and see. If we take a look at the Maharashtra uh, Shops and Establishment Act, the total hours of work per day is capped at nine, whereas under the labor codes, the specified nine hours includes rest time. However, weekly working hours are capped at 48, which is aligned to the labor codes. Further, uh, the Maharashtra Act also states that a worker cannot continuously work beyond five hours without a break of at least half an hour. Overtime at twice the ordinary rate of wages with capping of overtime hours at 125 per quarter is also provided. Uh, for those engaged in emergency work, the codes cap the spread of uh, spread over of hours of work at 16, while under the state act, it is more restricted to 12 hours. When it comes to leave provisions, uh, many shops and establishments act, including Karnataka and Tamil Nadu, permit carry forward up to 45 days, while under the codes, this is restricted to 30 days. Now, this could have a cash impact on organizations since it could trigger encashment of leave balances beyond 30 days. Besides, the codes also provide for mandatory encashment of wages beyond the 30-day limit. While these provisions are relevant to workers, organizations seeking to have a uniform policy may have to adopt these provisions across the board. Hence, this will call for discussions with the employee representatives, the HR department finance teams before a final decision can be taken. Okay, so let's now uh, move on to our next polling question and take some feedback from our participants. So the question is, do you see a challenge triggered by coexistence of central and state rules and the continuing Shops and Establishment Act? And you have your choices listed there, presence in multiple states and have challenges, presence in multiple states, but no major conflict and such, present in just one state, but still conflicts expected, presence in one state, no conflict expected, and not aware. So please go ahead and do share your uh, responses there. Till we get the results, uh, let's quickly discuss what would be the compliance requirement if employers have multi-state uh, presence. So Raswati, what would be your take on this? I think it's important for organizations to identify which are the regulations they would be covered under, especially if they are multi-state, and clearly 
in addition to the codes and the central rules the state rules would have a relevance and so would the shops and establishments act so it's important for organizations to see which is the one which is more beneficial to the employee see uh, in the event that there is a clash between these two clearly what is more favorable to the employee is what that is going to prevail so it's important for organizations to understand that and then uh, determine what would be relevant to them uh, and um, in in a short way i could also say that unless they are um, say a central government organization or um, you know railways banks and and so on definitely the state rules would apply to them there is a very limited exemption available from state rules uh, so that would be my take radhika organizations need to look at everything together and we also have our poll results which have come in and uh, not surprisingly uh, most of our uh, participants have uh, indicated that they have presence in multiple states and have challenges because of the uh, different rules and regulations and the continuation of certain legislations so we really need to wait and watch how the alignment is going to happen uh, with all these legislations now having said that the state rules will apply for majority of the organizations and they have also have multiple presence uh, tarun would you please take us through the list of states which have published their draft rules and the salient features of these sure thank you radhika let's just see the status of the states which have issued their respective draft rules under each of the codes being a concurrent subject it is important for the states also to notify the relevant rules and regulations under the four labor codes over the last few years there has been a significant progress on this front specifically tamil nadu and andhra pradesh have recently issued their respective draft rules under the codes while we still await the rules for states such as west bengal nagaland and meghalaya overall while 31 states have issued their draft rules on code on wages 21 states on code on social security this status stands at 26 states for the industrial relations code and 21 state states for the occupational safety health and working conditions code next let's see what are the areas listed under the respective central and the state draft labor code rules the central government is responsible for areas such as fixation of floor wage rates deciding on the exemption applications of the establishments from the provisions of provident fund employees state insurance act etc further the central rules also specify the manner for maintenance of career center setting up of central advisory boards on matters such as fixation or revision of minimum wages providing increasing employment opportunities for women employees other matters relating to framing of standing orders on the conditions of health service safety measures directing the national board to inquire into the health and safety standards of a factory recognize trade unions at the center level these are also covered under the central rules besides this the central rules also talk about filing of forms and returns and prescribes the formats in which the various registers and records are required to be maintained the state rules on the other hand broadly talks about matters that come under the respective state government's domain such as fixing of minimum rate of wages in the state specifying the weekly day of rest fixing the working hours and constitution of state advisory board to advise the state government on matters such as notifying minimum wages for a particular category of employees in the state say sales promotion employees or even for that matter working journalists and amongst others besides the state rules also mention what would be the relevant state appellate authority in a case where the employer or the employees aggrieved by the decision of the inspector come facilitator or the assessing officer now before we proceed further let's see what happens to those state which are yet to issue their respective draft state rules would that be a show stopper in the implementation of labor codes in that state well we don't believe that non availability of state rules would hinder the implementation now having said so the state government also will have to notify the state minimum wage rate rest days working hours etc so these state specific matters for such states shall be governed by the central rules pending the uh, state notifying its respective rules next 
let's do some deep dive on the state rules and to begin with the areas of alignment of state rules with the central rules in general when we see the state draft rules are aligned with the central draft rules in a number of areas and these areas are like weekly day of rest determination and payment of wages for the rest day rules pertaining to night shift hours safety procedures how much uh, has to be recovered from the wages and in what manner by when should the wages be paid for varying time limits say daily weekly fortnightly monthly wage time period and how should the fines be imposed state rules issued by haryana and delhi for instance lay down that the weekly day of rest should ordinarily be sunday although the employer is free to decide on any other day to be a weekly day of rest for any employee or class of employees similarly the wages for the rest day under both the states of haryana and delhi has been mentioned to be a rate applicable to the next preceding day which also seems to be aligned to that of the central rules other provisions relating to night shift and the requirement to give the rest day for the whole day deduction or recovery of wages which mentions that recovery in excess of 50% of wages has to be carried forward and recovered from the succeeding wage period these are also aligned with the central rules telangana tamil nadu odisha and the draft rules issued by the north north eastern states are also aligned with the central rules on these aspects which we just called out now so can one say that this simplification arm has been taken care of or this blanket statement can this be made do we still see any deviation in the state uh, rules vis-a-vis -vis the central rules the answer is yes and we'll now look at a closer uh, uh, look in the next slide speaking of the deviations uh, we do see still see there are few areas where uh, we find that the central uh, and the state rules are uh, divergent the labor code draft rules define the terms metro and non metropolitan area which is very relevant for the determination of minimum wages the draft central rules categorizes metro with a population of over 40 lakhs non metro with a population of less than 40 lakhs however when we look at the state rules say for example tamil nadu it has replaced the limit of 40 lakhs with that of 10 lakhs maharashtra on the other hand has divided the area into three zones which are like zone 1 zone 2 zone 3 and these are like having different criteria for categorization so it is important to know that the central rules empower the state governments to determine the normal or the flexible working hours now states such as gujarat telangana bihar tripura etc have notified the normal working hours per day and for per, on a per week basis say for example 8 hours plus 1 hour of rest and 48 hours per week maharashtra rules also specify that where flexi working arrangement is followed and overall 48 hours of work has been achieved in less than 6 days the remaining days of the week shall be paid as holidays this assumes importance particularly in the recent discussions of a 4 day working concept similar provisions are also available under the state rules of haryana as well well we do not find such flexi working arrangements explicitly called out in the state rules of tamil nadu karnataka punjab etc as regards to the working hours for people employed in emergency services the daily spread is restricted to 16 hours in the central rules whereas tamil nadu has restricted this to 14 hours and maharashtra and punjab further down to 12 hours states such as haryana delhi uttar pradesh madhya pradesh rajasthan and the ut of chandigarh on the other hand have kept the daily spread of hours for the employees engaged in the emergency services aligned to that of the central rules to 16 hours further in relation to forms filing and maintenance of registers the code on wages does not require any annual form filing however tamil nadu state code on wages rules require establishments which are not covered by occupational safety health and working conditions code to file the annual return in form number 7 now this is an annual compliance requirement that the establishments which fall within the jurisdiction of tamil nadu state Uh, not covered under the OSH code, they need to take care of this. Display of notices at prominent places of the establishment is also mandated as per the central draft rules. 
states have mentioned the languages in which these notices need to be displayed english and a local language which is understood by the employees and the employer in, uh, workers is the norm in most of the states tamil nadu in addition to display of notices at the workplace requires the establishments to also publish the notices in their websites too now with a move towards digitization and electronic record keeping this is an important deviation that tamil nadu establishments will have to bear in mind having seen a sample list of deviation let me raise one question now to saraswati saraswati what do you think be the impact of these deviations on the employers and the employees well tarun I, the overall sense i have is that the state and central rules are broadly aligned and that is to a great extent some states have provided more flexibility uh, say for instance you called out maharashtra and haryana providing flexible working hours which is specifically called out which is a welcome out, um, uh, approach uh, but unfortunately not all states have such kind of uh, you no know, detailing come out in the in the rules hence it's important for organizations to analyze the same state wise and again issue wise see for instance for display of notices we are saying that the state rules are a little more broader um and definitely would need to be followed so um, i think where flexibility is provided it's good for organizations to pick it up uh where the state rules are more stringent then of course there would need to be a compliance um from that perspective so my sense is and we we saw quite a few of the participants uh, uh today um have multiple state presence so they would really need to analyze the impact on their compliance processes um and then determine the internal policy again there is a thought would i really want to have varied policies across you no know, across various entities in various locations that is again something which organizations would need to take a call on uh, that's my thought tarun thank you thank you sir shruti so we will now move on to do a quick comparison of uh, how the draft rules compare with respect to or in comparison to the subsumed rules uh we do see a lot of legislation uh, changes and we can see that in the subsequent slide uh, starting right with applicability or coverage under the current legislation such as the payment of wages act the minimum wages act or the payment of bonus act applicability is limited to establishments that are specifically listed uh, such as factories or employees those who are in scheduled employment or as we saw for employees drawing wages below the statutory ceiling under the payment of wages act now the labor codes however do not have such conditions for applicability and therefore are wider the intent is to ensure that the benefits or the regulations that are made available are there for all organizations employees or workers another change that we are seeing is in the normal working hours under the current legislations the working hours have been prescribed separately for children adolescents and adults for instance it is 9 hours for adults 4 and 1/2 hours for children and for adolescents uh, it depends on whether they are certified to work as an adult or a child by a medical practitioner the labor codes on the other hand mention the hours of work for adult workers and employees but when it comes to adolescents they direct us to the provisions of the child and adolescent labor prohibition and regulation act of 1986 this act regulates the working hours of an adolescent to not more than 3 hours at a stretch without a rest interval of at least an hour and a total working hour limit of 6 hours a day including the rest interval further this act also prohibits overtime for adolescents and night shift for such categories of workforce in the case of overtime the wage rate has been fixed as twice the ordinary wage rate under the codes uh, currently we have two rates one and a half times for agricultural employment and twice the ordinary wage rate for other scheduled employment the capping of hours is also enhanced and it stands at 125 per quarter and state rules have aligned to this and not to their current limit of 50 for instance this is what we see in uh, tamil nadu karnataka or the punjab state rules which have been subsumed there are certain procedural aspects of the labor codes which we expect to be clarified in the form of notifications or changes to the central and state draft rules one such matter is the period of time for which records and registers have to be preserved under the current legislations there is no one answer some may require to be retained for a year some for 3 years and some others for 5 years for example 
the Jammu and Kashmir Payment of Wages Rules 1972 or the Tamil Nadu Minimum Wages Rules 1953 require employers to retain records for 12 months from the last date of entry in the register. The time period increases to three years under the Tamil Nadu Payment of Wages Rules or the Tripura Minimum Wages Rules 1952. Employment of women in night shift has also always been subject to adhering to stringent and additional conditions to ensure the safety and well-being of women employees. Uttar Pradesh has already come out with specific requirements in this respect for factories. Over to you, Saraswati. Right, uh, Radhika. Thanks. Uh, that was a crisp and quick summary, and it does capture the key uh, changes. Uh, well, we've been talking all along about uh, you know, what is there in the codes and in the rules, um, sticking to theory, but let us now look uh, take a couple of scenarios. And I also see some questions in terms of how would it practically impact organizations. So uh, let us move to the next slide to see uh, a case study in respect of a company in a manufacturing sector. And in this example, you can see the company has factories in three locations, Tamil Nadu, Gujarat, and Maharashtra. So let me see, uh, let me ask you this question, Radhika. How do you think the changes in minimum wages provisions will impact this organization? Again, from an PF, ESI, gratuity perspective, statutory bonus coverage, would it differ because they've got multi-state presence? Uh, what kind of leave policies would they need to look at? Um, can can the working hours over time, shift hours, can these be uniform? Uh, what kind of policies would they need to look at to make sure that they are aligned with both the labor codes and shops and establishments? We've got these questions up on the screen for ease of reference. Uh, but I thought I'll call this out. And Radhika, can you please help us understand some of these? Sure. So, Saraswati, under the codes, we are first going to have a national floor wage, which will be notified by the central government. So, Cool Cotton has to start by comparing this national floor wage with the minimum wages in the states where they have presence. And if the state minimum wages are higher and Cool Cotton is ensuring compliance with that, then there should be no issues. But uh, we also have to be mindful that the wages has to be determined in line with the new definition before such comparison can be made. Uh, on the other hand, if the state minimum wage is lower, then it would have to be increased to match the national floor wage. So once we have the new wages and ensure that it is at least on par with the national floor wage or the minimum wage, whichever is higher, then Cool Cotton will have to go ahead and compute the financial impact, which could be on Provident Fund, gratuity, maternity benefit, or even how many employees and workers are going to be covered going forward for gratuity or for ESI or uh, statutory bonus. And uh, because they are into the manufacturing sector and have factories, they could be having workers drawing less than the ceiling limit for provident fund, which is 15,000 per month, in which case uh, the change in provident fund contributions could also then take home pay. When it comes to leave policies, we do have deviation between uh, the rules and the Shops and Establishments Act that we saw. So we may have to wait for more clarity on that point. Uh, but Cool Cotton would also have to factor their current policy in the sense, do they have a single policy across uh, locations and across the different types of workforce that they have? And uh, what is it that they want to do going forward? Do they want to continue this practice? or they want to have separate uh, policies uh, categorized, uh, catering to the worker class and to the employees. So these factors they will have to bear in mind before they can make a final decision. When it comes to work hours or shifts or overtime provisions, uh, then I would say they will have to comply with the state rules because the state governments would be the appropriate governments here. Uh, so I hope I have answered those questions. As well. Yes, uh, Radhika, that was indeed detailed. Let me just move to the next uh, situation where we've tried to uh, put in uh, a situation of a company in a cyber sector. So the Cyber Security Lim Private Limited is in the business of providing information security services. This company has got operations in Rajasthan, Odisha, Telangana, Andhra Pradesh, and Karnataka, where the registered office is located. And so what would be the appropriate government for this company? And would it need to make any changes to its policies and procedures further to the labor code? What kind? And so uh, let me just pass this on to Tarun. I know Radhika has put in quite a bit of aspects which would broadly be applicable to the service industry. But Tarun, if you could call out uh, from a service industry perspective, that would be helpful. Sure, Saraswati. 
as we have discussed before and as uh, rightly called out by radhika also the appropriate government here would also be the respective state governments where the cyber security private limited has operations that is the five states besides uh, uh, changes to the wage period settlement timelines capping deductions and the impact of the new wage definition that are applicable to all the company cyber security private limited would also have to comply with the standing order requirements safety measures to be put into place for women employees and obtaining consent from the women employees for their uh, say late sittings night shifts etc cyber security private limited would also have to see the pattern of workforce employed by it and uh, there like thereby to identify if there is a need to qualify any worker as a gig worker if it has a gig worker then it would also have to ensure that they are registered with the national registry and also undertake the compliances that the central government would stipulate under the social security regime for the gig workers now moving on to the last polling question of this webcast this is specifically for those organizations with presence in more than one state your question is if you have operations across geographies would you want to have a specific uniform policy that is applicable factoring the individual geography mandates and your choices are yes we uh, we wouldn't want to differentiate based on the location no location specific uh, ex expectations or exceptions to broader policies may be required or no policies uh, will have to be location specific and the last one being the not applicable now while we wait for the polling results uh, saraswati what do you think the multi locational companies should do in terms of the policies so i think uh, makarun we've seen that broadly the state rules are in line with the central rules but there are areas of deviation we know that the shops and establishments act is going to continue so there is still going to be and and this is something that exists even today there would be a need for organizations to understand what is their location specific compliance or uh, no documentation that they would need to maintain keeping in mind the state rules as well as the option establishments um, act in addition to the central code as well as the central rules so they would need to evaluate do i have the right policies in place for instance we saw leave is an area of working hours or some areas where there could be um, deviations so and the other broader call that comes out from this question is do would they want their policies aligned across locations uh, in other words have uniform policies or are they open to have location specific policies again some provisions are those under the occupational safety health and working conditions code are applicable only to workers so would they want a different provision that would be applicable to workers against employees so these are things which again organizations would need to keep in mind so um uh, the other aspect also and i think uh, from a contract labor also they would need to look at uh, saying that core non core um, um activities am, am i deploying employees in those area so broadly a thorough evaluation of the current and the new requirement would need to be done and then uh, organizations would need to determine whether they want a uniform policy or not and then put all of this in place so Uh, i do think there's a lot of work to be done there taro thank you saraswati let's just uh, now see the uh, uh, poll results uh, well we when we see that uh, as as expected yes most of the participants also feel that they wouldn't want to differentiate based on the location and they want a uniform policy but we still see uh, uh, our participants few participants like 17% that they find that location specific expect exceptions have to be called out and it's important and few others like 18% still believe that like it's not applicable to them right i think we have a mixed bag but majority seems to be looking at no uniform policies uh, which yeah. means that they have to look at what is the best of all of those and then provide uh, so let me just go to maybe we are coming towards the uh, end of the slide we've talked about um, so many changes coming up um, and we know there are some clarifications still um, awaited so the question that arises is what do companies really do now uh, and we also are thinking that the transition time may not be too long 
So when do we commence the implementation? Well, I would say start the journey now if you already haven't done so. Uh, you could start by beginning to, to take a stock of the potential financial impact. Radhika talked about it. We need to see what is the impact on gratuity, whether from a PF perspective, are you going to get impacted? Uh, look at for opportunities in terms of realigning salary structure. Um, you may want to incorporate some of these changes right away. Uh, I would say, for instance, simple changes like moving from a flexible to a fixed pay component structure does not really require a deferment. So some of these can be implemented right away since there are no significant impact on employees. Uh, again, it's also important for organizations to determine the approach um, on additional gratuity costs. So on the ongoing gratuity cost, if they are going to increase, uh, is it part of CTC? Who's going to pick up the cost? If it's a part of CTC, do you want to protect the employees for this? So, And if you want to protect it, is it only for the initial one year? Would you want to adjust it once the next increment comes in? So these are decisions. This will take time and would require a lot of deliberation. So precisely the reason why an early start will definitely help organizations. The other thing is also the compliance changes. So it's not just the financial impact. Um, the timeline for settlement of wages, and I see some questions around this, and um, obviously we've discussed this with the government and we get the feel that this is here to stay. That is the initial feedback we received from the government. Uh, and these, and we need to be prepared. What do I do? Do I uh, prepare for off payroll runs? Do I uh, standardize the exit date? So there are quite a few thoughts around this that organizations need to deliberate upon. Uh, and obviously, the actual implementation would need to happen after the codes become effective, but um, uh, quite a bit of these decisions can be taken well in advance. Uh, again, I think we cannot um, overstress on the topic of uh, categorization of workforce. Today, the labor codes, uh, the way they are, uh, would really be applicable to much beyond the regular employees. Need to look at the contract labor um, implications implications relating to fixed term employees broader workforce gig workers do you have consultants would they be categorized as gig workers are you an aggregator would you have a cost impl implication that's triggering right away is there some amount of ring fencing that you need to do in terms of your um no contract uh, agreements these are areas which you would definitely need to look at some uh, aspects uh, in terms of uh, being better prepared would also include understanding the level of digitization that's required to meet labor code compliances. What state are you in? Where, if the um, labor codes require you to file, uh, provide online filings, uh, what kind of changes would you need to need to make to your payroll systems? Uh, at least identifying those and being ready with it is something that would definitely uh, ease the process of uh, transitioning. Um, I also think the payroll processes. Um, so is your, will your payroll process need to be tweaked to determine wages on an ongoing way? Clearly, basic salary is not going to be the determinant. It is wages. So is your payroll process uh, required to be changed? Um, what kind of technology teams do you get involved for these discussions? These are some things that can definitely be picked up even before the effective date announcement. Uh, again, uh, governance from a compliance perspective, contractor compliances. While the principal employer definition under the labor codes includes contractor, still there are aspects where the principal employer is required to meet contractor, um, be, will be held responsible for contract compliances. So what is the current level of governance? Do you need to step it up? Uh, there are many aspects that organizations would need to look at. So again, um, last but definitely not the least, what is your strategy on employee communication? Employees are reading quite a lot of about this in, in media. So how are we going to handle that? So I think um, we are getting to the top of the hour. Um, but let me just pass on, pick up at least a couple of questions. Um, so let me pick you up, uh, get to you, Radhika, first. Um, given that the government would like to roll the labor codes in 2022, and the impact of new definition uh, would be felt in the possibly on the take home pay of employees. Should companies change the compensation structure and increase the basic pay? This is one question that I'm seeing getting repeated. So, can you please pick those up? Sure. And, Saraswati, before I get to the specifics, I actually wanted to touch upon one assumption that I've heard multiple times, 
which is like if your basic pay is uh, 15% of your remuneration, then it meets the wage definition and therefore uh, is in compliance with the uh, statutory provisions. Now, we have seen that this is clearly not the case because the cap of 50% is on the exclusion list. And again, the exclusions are very uh, clearly defined. So if you have a compensation structure which has more components that will fall under the inclusion bracket or where exclusions are very minimal, then wages would definitely more, be more than 50%. And coming back to the question, increasing basic will have a direct impact on uh, provident fund contributions, uh, also on the gratuity accrual if it is part of CTC, and therefore could reduce uh, take home. So organizations could see if a realignment could be done uh, based on introducing new components or enhancing some components which form part of the exclusion structure. However, they would also have to be mindful of the tax impact while doing so. So I would say there's no one way of realignment, but uh, just increasing the basic may not be the best approach. Hope I have Thank answered you, the question. Radhika. Thank, thanks. And I, I hope uh, I've tried to keep the question broad based to include multiple questions that we are seeing in the Q&A box. Uh, there's one more question. I think this is very important from a core, non-core activity perspective. Tarun, if, if you could pick it up. See, we are hearing a lot about the requirement of having a regular employees uh, carry out core activities. That is, uh, contract labor cannot be used for core activities. So how are we seeing companies gearing up and are we seeing companies revisiting their business models? Can you quickly pick that up? Uh, I know we are on sure. top of the hour. Yeah, sure, Saraswati. Thanks. Just very quickly. Uh, if we see the provisions of OSH code, it specifically prohibits carrying out of core activities through the contract labor. And it is like indeed an area the companies need to watch out for. So the core activity for this purpose, as we see, is basically defined to mean the activity which establishment or for which the establishment is set up and includes activity which is essential or necessary to such activity. And then there are like certain activities which are called out as non-core. Even if these are essential or necessary, such as like your security guard services, canteen, catering services, support activities, such as educational training institution, guest houses, etc. So there are further exceptions. For instance, if the normal functioning of an establishment is such that the activity is ordinarily done through a contractor, or if the use of the contract labor is to meet a sudden increase in the volume of work in the core activity, then there is no prohibition. But one thing again to be noted is that like the, for these exceptions in the definition of contract labor, hence the approach which I see the companies are taking is to have a deeper dive into the nature of workforce, whether it fits into the definition of a contract labor, what is the purpose of engaging, whether it fits into the exception provision, etc. So in nutshell, we do see companies looking at these aspects more closely than before in the wake of these new labor codes. Right. Thanks, uh, Tarun. That was a detailed answer. Thank you so much for that. Uh, so Radhika, Tarun, uh, thank you so much for sharing your views. Uh, unfortunately, this is all the time we have planned for the session. A special thanks to all of you who could join us today for this session. You could, you would shortly see a survey pop up in your screen. Uh, please do let us know your feedback about today's session. If you've joined us late, please note that this presentation will be archived for future viewing. Uh, if you feel the others would benefit from this, please share the webcast via the share this icon or have them visit the deep briefs website. We will respond to all the questions submitted during the webcast. Uh, I know there have been quite a lot of them. Um, we will do we will respond to them uh, in the next couple of weeks. Uh, if you think of any other question or comments, please feel free to reach out to to me or to our speakers. We'll be more than happy to talk to you. And please don't forget to tune into our next scheduled webcast from the transfer pricing series this is on 19th of july 2022 entitled transfer pricing dispute resolution a focus on china so from all of us at deloitte thank you for your participation in deloitte's asia pacific tax webcast today goodbye <laughs>